Dr. Shimontini Ghosh is an assistant professor of psychology at Ashoka University. She works at the intersections of gender-based violence and mental health and is very interested in looking at the systematic violence against women. What she believes is that sometimes violence is not overt. It's not directly measurable as physical or sexual acts of violence, but is often psychological. There can be other kinds of stresses that can impinge on women. In this video, she talks about domestic violence and intimate partner violence, complex trauma and PTSD, the associated cognitive and affective issues, and intergenerational transmission. We process trauma in a very different uh, way than we process um, what we, you know otherwise normal thought. The encoding of traumatic memory, for example, um, uses somewhat different mechanisms in the brain. Especially in, in case of PTSD and what we recognize today as more complex PTSD, not only involves the classical um, symptomatology of PTSD, which involves flashbacks, re-experiencing trauma, avoidant behavior, so on and so forth. But in addition, there is a very um, sense of self, the self-perception um, gets warped. The survivors of complex trauma or anyone who has um, experienced a form of trauma that they feel that they have no control over their own lives and um, they cannot escape from it no matter what. The, the chronicity is what sets complex trauma apart from um, an acute exposure uh, to a traumatic incident. When we experience trauma, a, a lot of the brain processes which are involved in sensing these cognitive pieces of information are shut down. So they don't work properly. And traumatic memories, so they get coded in terms of emotional balance. So whatever the, the emotional part of our brain is an evolutionarily primitive part that cannot shut down even if the more evolutionary modern part of the frontal part of the brain shuts down and prevents encoding of these really important who, when, what, where, this sort of cognitive information. But what you end up using uh, to encode traumatic memory is this whole emotional experience, the horror, the anger, the shame. And, and this is when a lot of times when um, even clinicians ask um, survivors to, re to sort of tell them what their trauma was abused, it is very difficult to talk about it. A, because you do not have that seamless uh, flow of information. You only remember very fragmented, disjointed imageries, your sensor sensory modalities in your brain are not being processed like they would for a normal memory. If you just try to connect to this in an, in an emphatic manner, this is horrible because the person experiences all that anger, shame and whatever negative emotions they had experienced during the trauma all over again. But they don't have any solid cognitive information to put that into words. That sense is not there. For survivors of chronically abusive um, situations and trauma, they re-victimize themselves. They tend to, they get into a pattern, they fall into a pattern of abusive relationships and, and there's obviously, it turns out very bad for them. So they have a history of these relationships. A lot of these individuals not only have a very abusive adult relationship history, but they are also survivors of abuse as children themselves. 
One is people who have just grown up witnessing domestic violence in their households. And the other, which is oftentimes much more serious, are unfortunately children who have witnessed um, violence on themselves as, as a child. And, and childhood abuse and neglect is frightfully common in our country. In our pilot studies, which we conducted in, in villages of Haryana, um, a disproportionately large number of women ended up supporting the idea that even if your husband is, is beating you, he's doing it because he really loves you. And, and you know, it's just as if um, they are, it's, it's a benevolent guardian um, at those who's just trying to control an aspect of their behavior. One of the central tenets in the research of gender psychology is that just do not look at um, differences in gender behavior, but rather look at the variables which are driving that, that difference, um, is, is understanding how violence is transmitted and, and what is the contribution of external enforcement vis-a-vis -vis women self-censoring themselves because they grew up with this set patterns of, of gender beliefs. The trends that we are seeing is that especially loss of autonomy and the elements of control um, are omnipresent and psychological violence is omnipresent. The women in this strata are also uh, much more guarded when it comes to disclosing abusive behavior such as physical or sexual abuse and, and they themselves know that these are negatively balanced things to talk about um, in any context. So they are much more guarded. and. You know, I'll just give you one example. There are tutorials in on YouTube uh, which teach you how to hide black marks on your face. In a lot of the situations, people have asked me, why do I engage with this research? It is not easy. It has a lot of vicarious trauma. And my only answer is that when we go out in the field, and a lot of times when they are under so much psychological stress, their self-perception has changed and they often feel like they don't matter. They are completely ineffective as people. At that times, I think one of the main reasons that they, they feel like they have no voice. They feel like no matter what they do, no matter how much they try, they're not going to matter anyway. And I think we have a duty towards making uh, the general public more cognizant of, of how deeply gendered the, the, the relationships are in our society. And that has very real life impact for people who suffer because of it. And that's why I do this. That's why I engage with it. Because I honestly believe that, you know, yes, it is tough. You're going to see things that's probably going to make your skin crawl. But if you want to make a difference, you have to do it. You have to go out there and if you have to gather the data.